All right, so now I'm going to go over the gram positive rods. I'm going to go through this very fast because it's very easy and it's not too high yield. So the two categories of gram positive rods are those that form spores and those that don't form spores. The ones that form spores are very resistant to heat and chemicals. They're very hard to kill, but you can kill them by a process called autoclaving where you expose them to high heat at 120 degrees Celsius. That's a mouthful. Remember, spore forming, if they form a spore, that's a non-metabolically active ball shield that protects the bacteria, very resistant, but you can kill it by autoclaving at high heat. The non-spore forming don't form spores, they're not resistant to heat and chemicals. The two genera or genuses for the spore forming are Bacillus and Clostridium, and the non-spore forming are Coronae bacterium and Listeria. So now we're going to go into the Bacillus genus, and we're going to talk about the two species, which are Anthraxis, which, surprise, 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 causes anthrax, and Bacillus cereus, which causes food poisoning. So let's get on with the anthrax. This can be transmitted three ways, but the two most important ones are cutaneous and inhalation. It can still be passed by the GI tract, but really cutaneous and inhalation. This is very, very, very high yield. Whenever something says it's the only bacteria, think high yield. Especially when it says capsule, you think higher yield. All right, It's the only bacteria where the capsule is a peptide, which is D-glutamate. Right? Most capsules, or all other capsules, are polysaccharides. The capsule in anthrax is a peptide, which is D-glutamate. Now, do not mistake this for the main virulence factor. The main virulence factor is the toxin it produces in the next page. But this is very, very unique to anthrax. And it's found in animal products like leather and wool. So if someone's sorting leather and wool and they get a black mark on their skin or they get uh, pneumonia type symptoms or flu-like symptoms, you can think of anthrax and also biochemical warfare. And I'm gonna go into the clinical symptoms in a bit. But before we go there, we need to talk about the anthrax toxin. Here's the toxin, has, or here's the anthrax bacteria, I'm sorry, and the toxin has three subunits, all right? The toxin is really composed of three toxins, PA, protective antigen, LF, lethal factor, and EF, edema factor. This is nice because it tells you all three, it tells you what it does in the name, except for protective antigen. Protective antigen that I know of has no protective effect, but I think of the P as pore antigen. Why? Because the pore antigen forms pores in the cell that allow EF and LF to enter. So even though it's called protective antigen, I don't know if it has any protective effects. But what I do know is it forms a pore inside the cell that allows the lethal factor and edema factor to enter. And once you take care of this, well then the lethal factor kills the cell, necrosis, and it does so by decreasing MAP kinase. The edema factor causes edema by increasing CAMP. All right, so anthrax toxin, three subunits, as protective antigen, lethal factor, edema factor, protective antigen makes pores, lethal factor kills a cell by decreasing MAP kinase, edema factor causes edema by increasing CAMP. This is cutaneous anthrax. It causes the black SR. This is a black center, which is necrotic. What causes the necrotic part of the black SR? It is the lethal factor, which decreases MAP kinase. Around here you get edema. What causes the edema? It is the increase in camp by the edema factor. All right, so this is cutaneous anthrax and that's how they can ask you a question on that. Pulmonary, there's an L right there, I'm sorry about that. Pulmonary anthrax is also called wool sore disease. Why? Because people that deal with wool tend to inhale these spores. These spores initially prevent, present as influenza-like symptoms. You can mistake this for the flu. But eventually, you get hemorrhagic mediastinus, and then, well, that's no longer the flu. That's, that's, now you're on to anthrax. And sometimes you can get hemorrhagic meningitis. But anything hemorrhagic following the flu, think of anthrax. Treatment is ciprofloxacin, which is a DNA gyrase, and people forget this. It also inhibits topoisomerase 4. So it's a DNA gyrase topoisomerase 4 inhibitor. Bacillus cereus, I'm sure everyone's heard their jokes about Bacillus cereus, but I'm not going to say any jokes because we're studying for the step one and we need to be serious. All right, now that you guys have recovered from that, this causes food poisoning associated with fried rice, fried rice, Chinese food. So food poisoning with Chinese food. 
Any of you that have ever reheated your Chinese food and gotten a pretty bad diarrhea have been a victim of Bacillus cereus. What happens is the spore grows on the rice and uh, or the spore is already in the rice and as you leave the rice out while you're eating it, the bacteria begin to germinate and then they start releasing the toxin onto the rice. And once the toxin's been released, you can refrigerate it, you can reheat it, but you're not going to disable that toxin and you're going to get a terrible time. These are the two toxins that it produces. First is the super antigen. What else produces super antigen? Staphylococcus aureus. This is also heat stable and a short incubation time, which means one hour to three hours after ingesting this, you're going to get vomiting and watery diarrhea. The other one is the ADP ribosylation to G stimulatory protein. This is the same mechanism as cholera and traveler's diarrhea from E. coli, which we'll get into in a different time. But this has a, this is heat labile. It's sensitive to heat, but it has a longer incubation time of 13 to 18 hours. That's Bacillus cereus. Now we're going to completely switch our genus to Clostridium. Clostridium has four species, but I mean two of these are very straightforward: tetanus and Botox. And then the other one causes gangrene, and the other one causes pseudomembranous colitis, which if you haven't heard of, you're going to get that beat into you by the time you're done. So, clostridium tetany causes tetanus, which is spastic paralysis, which initially presents as lockjaw. See, microbiology is just one big circle. Tetanus, spastic paralysis, presents as lockjaw and muscle spasms. All right, the portal of entry is a wound site. Someone steps on a rusty nail and they get tetanus. That's always a classic example. It can also be carried on by drug users, but just know the portal of entry is a wound site. Tetanus toxin is carried inside a neuron. I show you. Oh, Lord. I don't know what I'm doing here. All right, this is the worst neuron you'll ever see. This is the axon. This is the nucleus. The tetanus toxin goes up the axon into the nucleus in what is called retrograde transport. Remember, any normal neuron, or most of the time, the neuron rece releases neurotransmitters this way. All right, But when it starts going backwards, like the tetanus toxin does to the nucleus, it's called a retrograde transport. Tetanus binds to ganglioside receptors, and this is the single most important thing of tetanus. It inhibits GABA and glycine. It inhibits GABA and glycine. These are the inhibitors of the CNS. So it inhibits the inhibitors. If you inhibit an inhibitor, you can no longer inhibit, which means that you get an excitatory response. Remember, anytime you inhibit something that inhibits, you get an excitatory response. That's why alcohol makes you stupid, because GABA is an inhibitor, and alcohol increases GABA's activity, which inhibits other inhibitors, and then you say things that you wouldn't normally say, and you get in trouble with your friends. All right, so anytime you inhibit an inhibitor, you get an excitatory response. Renshaw cells are shown in the spinal cord. This is very low yield, but maybe they can tell you something such as someone stepped on a rusty nail, they got spastic paralysis. What do you expect to find in the spinal cord? What kind of cells? Well, these would be Renshaw cells. How do you treat tetanus? Well, it looks like I have a virus. You treat vet and tetanus via passive active immunity. This means you give a vaccine and immunoglobulin to tetanus. This is similar to rabies. This entire process is called passive active immunity and there is of course a vaccine available. Botulism causes flaccid paralysis. Why? Here's a neuron, here's a muscle. The neuron releases acetylcholine, acetylcholine to the muscle. This causes the muscle to twitch. Botulism, Botox, prevents this from happening. The acetylcholine is not being released. Therefore, this muscle can't twitch. So you get a flaccid paralysis. This is associated with canned vegetables, smoked fish, and honey, especially in babies, which is why we don't give babies honey. All right, do you need to know canned vegetables, smoked fish? Unfortunately, yes. And um, block the release of acetylcholine, and you can use this for the treatment of wrinkles and twitches. If you have an eye that's twitching violently, the reason is because your nerve keeps sending off acetylcholine to the muscle. You can block this with Botox, or botulism toxin, really. And it causes a descending weakness, so first you may lose, like, you may have trouble 
blinking or something and then eventually it'll descend to your arms and then to your diaphragm and you don't want your diaphragm to not work because you then you can't breathe and you suffocate to death and you die treatment is anatoxin why don't you give a vaccine well the botulism the botulism toxin has eight types tetanus has one type so theoretically you could give a vaccine but there's too many types of botox to actually have an effective vaccine Clostridium perfringes causes gas, gangrene, or necrotizing fasciitis. There, everyone knows what gangrene is. You know, we've all heard of bacteria eating your skin, but the bacteria is not eating your skin. It's actually releasing a toxin called alpha toxin. So this bacteria works by you get in a car wreck, you have a wound, your wound's exposed, you get contaminated with soil. The soil has spore-forming clostridium perfringes. The perfringes begins to germinate and release alpha toxin, which alpha toxin begins to degrade your tissues. And um, why is it called gas gangrene? Well, it's very simple. It produces gas. That's the only reason it's called gas gangrene. And this, the gas in the tissues when you have gangrene, is called crepitation. Whenever you think crepitation, think gas, gan, green. Treatment's penicillin. Clostridium difficile causes pseudomembranous colitis due to antibiotics. The antibiotics destroy the normal flora in your gut. When you destroy the normal flora, it allows Clostridium difficile to start growing and releasing toxins A and toxins B. That's actually the name. The name is toxins A and toxins B. And these both glucosylate, they add a glucose to rho GTPase, which is a G protein. This, no, oh, I can't believe I missed that. This is not a verb. This is an, is, I mean, this is a verb. This is not a noun. This is not a noun. This is a verb. It means adds a glucose to rho GTPase. All right? And um, the only people that can get pseudomembranous colitis are people that have clostridium difficile obviously if you don't have this bacteria you can't get it that's why people that take clindamycin that don't get pseudomembranous or uh, take clindamycin and don't get pseudomembranous colitis is because they don't actually have c difficile the symptoms are a patient takes antibiotics and they after afterwards they present with abdominal cramps water diarrhea fever bloody stools pseudomembranous colitis mediated by toxins A, toxin B, with both with bo added glucose to rho GTPase. The treatment for most anaerobic bacteria is metronidazole, and that's it for the gram-positive spore-forming bacteria.